Hey everyone, this is a 65 millimeter racing loop that I recently built with the HD Zero digital FPV system. I showed a video recently, maybe you saw that, racing around inside my house. It was a ton of fun, but I couldn't use that much high throttle inside. There's just not enough space. So today, I've brought it out in the backyard and I'm gonna do some freestyle acro. I'm gonna push it fast and hard and we'll find out just how much performance headroom is left uh, after carrying digital FPV. I might even try diving these giant Douglas firs behind the house. <laughs> I don't know if that's a good idea, uh, but if it can pull out of that, that'll be pretty sweet. I'm gonna give it a try. So that should be fun. That'll be later in the video. But first, I wanna take you back inside because to me, the process of building and tinkering and all the little decisions that go into a build, that stuff is just as much a part of the hobby as actually flying. And I filmed the process of building this. So I wanna share that with you today. And then we'll come out here and fly. Um, also, if you wanna build something for yourself, I am happy to say that these components, the HD Zero Lite, 1S parts are finally available for sale and there's links down in the video description if that's something you've been waiting for. Or if building isn't your thing, Happy Model just released a bind and fly drone. It's the Mobula 6 HD Zero. Uh, I haven't flown it yet. I can't tell you much about it, but it does have some pretty similar components. It might even be cheaper if you have to buy all of these parts uh, from scratch. So that's another thing to look into. Link in the video description. So my plan for today is to build something very similar to this 65 millimeter 1S that I built before, but using the new components. And why 65 millimeters? Uh, for me, it's just because this is the most popular size. It's the smallest size. And I figure if digital FPV can work in something this size, then it can work for just about any build that I would make. So that's one reason. And the other reason is 65 millimeter 1S is the spec for racing. Sometimes local races will allow different sizes, but all the high level races uh, that I'm aware of require 65 millimeter with the 31 millimeter props. So this is very standard for racing. And I'm just really interested in seeing how far we can push that with digital FPV. Oh, and in case I didn't make it crystal clear, this is not gonna be the easiest build. If you are a beginner and you're worried about soldering, this might not be the build for you yet. But uh, if you're interested in saving weight and seeing what I would wanna do, uh, that's why I'm making this video. I'm building this for myself. This is how I would do it just for myself. I like to make them nice and light. It's not about making it as light as it possibly could be because it still has to be durable. It still has to have great performance. I'm gonna build this the way I wanna fly it and these modifications are gonna be necessary. So if you wanna follow along, uh, that's awesome. But again, don't feel pressure. If you're new to this hobby and you just want to fly, I suggest you get a bind and fly drone or go with a really simple build formula just to get you up in the air. If you're ready to try something a little bit more advanced and you wanna really push the boundaries of what something like this can do with digital FPV, that's what I'm into and that's what we're gonna do with this one. Okay, so naturally the first thing I'm gonna need is a frame. And for 65 millimeter 1S, these are the two frames that can work that I know of. Uh, not every frame is gonna work because what I want specifically is to have this super low profile. I don't want anything except the camera to stick up so that it is as compact and as small and light as it possibly can be. And the way to do that is to put the video transmitter on top where the flight controller would normally go and put the uh, flight controller on the bottom. And the key there is you have to have enough space between the frame and the battery tray. So that works in this frame, and I'm pretty sure it'll work in this one as well. The frame I used last time is an older Beta FPV frame. It was the Meteor 65 Pro frame. I think it was version three of that frame. They don't make this frame anymore, but if you want this frame, you can get it from tinywoop.com. Jesse Perkins told me he found a bunch of these in the back warehouse, and so he's selling those again, and there's a link in the video description. The advantage of this frame is it's super, super tough, and it has enough space down here that you can put the USB right where it would normally go and it doesn't even block the battery. So that's fantastic, but this frame is a little heavier than the newer frame, so I'm gonna try this one this time. Now this is a frame like they use in the Mobula 6, although I've seen frames that look identical sold under different names, so they must have the same mold. You can know that it's the one that we're looking at by the shape of this battery tray down here. It's not the most durable, but it is very light. And I think there's gonna be enough space down here as long as we take the flight controller and rotate it. USB is gonna to have to be on the side so it doesn't block the battery, but I think that'll work, so I'm gonna give it a try. Here's a test fit so you can get an idea of how that's gonna go in. The USB has to be on the side so it doesn't block the battery. Now these motor connectors are gonna block the battery that way, but I'm gonna take them off. I was gonna do that anyway to save some weight, but that is gonna be necessary with this frame. With the other frame, I think it's optional because these will still be on the side. You could leave them on if you wanted to. Again, I'm gonna take them off anyway and I'll show you how I do that in just a second. 
The other thing you can see is that I'm using, this is a Beta FPV F4 1S board, and it's got Express LRS built in, which is fantastic. I love Express LRS. It's great to have a reliable link and to have it built into the flight controller and everything, but this chip antenna does stick up a little bit more than I want it to, and it is going to get in the way of the VTX, which is going to sit right on top of this. So I'm going to have to modify that antenna as well. So let's get started with that. Nate from the future here, one quick word of caution if you use this particular flight controller. The manufacturer sent out a batch of these with a buggy version of the firmware, and the first time you power it up, it could permanently mess up the gyro. And so I made a public service announcement video about that. Be sure you check that out if you choose to use this particular flight controller. Soldering on camera is not going to be the easiest thing to do, but I'm going to give it a try for you guys. So this is some blue tack. It's great for holding things in place while you solder, and I'm just going to stick the flight controller on there because my first task is going to be to remove these motor plugs. And for me, the easiest way to do that is to put a little bit of solder on the back side of it and just bridge them all together so that I can melt that and pull it all out all at once. Now I'm going to take a pair of locking forceps and just lock it onto one of these. I don't care if I bend the pins or anything like that because I'm going to be ripping the whole thing off. But this is just going to come in like that. And I want to be able to put some counter pressure on it while I melt all three of those solder points on the other side. Let's see if I can do this on camera. Oops, that only got one of the pins out. I'll have to get the other ones in a second. This is easier to do on the edge of the table, but I can't record it there. Well, the bad news is these pins didn't all come out with the plugs the way I wanted them to. Usually that works, but I can get them out anyway. Now we just have to do them one at a time. And again, I'm going to use my locking forceps for that. I'm just going to clip on one of them and heat from the other side and let it pull out. To get those sutter balls off, I'm just going to use some of this wicking with a bit of flux paste. It's a good thing to have. Yep, and I'll just spread it right onto the end of the wicking. Grab my soldering iron. Come along right in here. And as I melt this, it'll also, there you go, suck it right up into the wicking. The smoke you see is a little bit of that uh, flux burning off. That's totally fine. Get this one. I like how you can just see the solder walk its way right up the wicking. All right, the next thing we're going to have to change is this Express LRS chip antenna. As I mentioned before, it sticks up too much. I'm going to start by adding just a little bit of extra solder at the base. That's going to help conduct some heat onto these posts that are support structure posts. There we go. Just breaks off. Normally that'd be really bad. In my case, totally intentional. So those chip antennas were great, but for my purpose, with a racing whoop, I don't need super long range. I think we're probably going to get enough range with a simple little wire antenna like you used to see on whoops like FR Sky or DSMX whoops. And I have one of those little wires right here, but any piece of wire would actually work, it just has to pick up the radio waves and it has to be the right length. And the correct length is one quarter wavelength at 2.4 gigahertz. That works out to about 31.22 millimeters. You can see that's about how long this one is, or at least the part that will stick out from the board. So all I've got to do is solder this in to the tiny little antenna hole on the underside of the flight controller. Okay, so I think that'll do it for the antenna. I haven't tested it yet, but I think that's probably going to be fine. And it's going to be on the underside of the drone, so it should be out of the way. And then the other thing on here is this power cord. So let's talk about that for just a minute. This is 22 gauge wire, which is great. Uh, and the connector on the end is Beta FPV's BT 2.0 connector. Now, I often modify these power cords to shorten them up. You can see I did that on this previous build. I like to use these 90 degree pH 2.0 connectors. Uh, they're a little bit lighter and they can be good if you get the real ones, which are made by JST. I get them from DigiKey. Uh, they're the only good PH2 connectors that I've used, but these are really good and it allows for really short power cord if you do that. So I like that, but I've decided to use 
the BT 2.0 connector on this one. And here's the reason. I recently got a whole bunch of these BT 2.0 tattoo batteries and they are fantastic. The cells are every bit as good as the Nitro Nectar Golds, which are much more expensive battery. These cells are about the same for all I can tell, which is fantastic. And that BT 2.0 connector uh, does give a little bit better connection under heavy load. I'm planning to use these Happy Model EX0802 25,000 kV motors. These Happy Model EX0802 motors are the lightest 802 motors on the market. Uh, that's why I like them. I've had good success in the past. And this is the Unibel design, so that should be good for durability. Jason from Happy Model was kind enough to send these to me. He also sent me their 702 motor. This is a 23,000 kV. This is a slightly smaller motor, and this would save some weight. Uh, I've considered using this one, but... I was thinking about it and I really think, especially with the extra weight of digital, having just a little bit more stator volume is going to help maintain that performance and prop control. And it might even be a little bit more efficient. I noticed that the windings on the 802 are a little bit bigger than on this other one, and it might just be able to handle the current a little bit better. So right now, my best guess is that the 802 is still going to be the size to use, but uh, maybe I'll try this one later. I am kind of curious. So to get these motors on here, I'm just going to clip off the connectors right at the base of the connector. That'll give me the full length of wire to work with. I don't like having the wires too short. Sometimes they get yanked. So I'm going to trim all those off and strip the wires and then pre-tin these pads and solder them right on. So that's pretty much the whole powertrain right there coming in at 10.6 grams. And while we're getting weights, this is the new 1S video transmitter that I'll be using. It's coming in at 4.5 grams. And here's the new light camera. I'll be trying this one out. 1.6, 1.7 grams. MIPI cable, 0.44. The frame is 3.3. I'm almost ready to put this in the frame, but first I'm gonna go ahead and wire up the video transmitter. It's gonna need a handful of different wires. I'm gonna put transmit on the flight controller to receive on the video transmitter. Receive goes to transmit. For power, I'm gonna take power from the main battery leads down here. Uh, I think you could take it off of the five volt regulator on the flight controller, but I don't wanna overload that. Uh, this takes more current than a regular camera. So I'm gonna take main power lead there and then one more wire for smart audio. So I think we're ready to mount it into the frame. Normally you'd have these posts on the top side and that's where the video transmitter is gonna go, but the flight controller is gonna go on the bottom. And I don't know if you can see, but there are no holes on the bottom. We're gonna to have to invent those holes because the frame wasn't meant to be used this way, but we're gonna make it work. I've got these tiny little screws here and this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna grip the screw with my handy forceps and then just apply a little bit of heat to the end of it, just so that I can stick the tip of it into the plastic a little bit more easily. Now that I've started the holes, I should be able to put those screws in with a screwdriver, and the screws are basically gonna be going into the post, but from the other side. So I'm gonna put it like this with power and uh, USB on the right-hand side, and this is the front. But to get it in there, it looks like I'm gonna to have to tuck these motors through the hole. And that's just because of where the placement of those solder pads are on this flight controller. Power cord is gonna go down the side. And then these motors are gonna go through this hole right here in the back. Okay, I went ahead and screwed it all into place. You can see I've got silicon grommets to soft mount the flight controller. And normally you wouldn't want to compress those too much. Here you do have to compress it a little bit just to make sure there's space so that the board isn't touching the frame. You wouldn't want vibrations coming in from the frame. Uh, but I think that'll work. And then you can see I've got some extra wire on the motors. Uh, I'm just gonna tuck those in. And for the motors, you can see I've got two screws per motor right now with the metal screws. Uh, and that's because I'm not gonna keep these metal screws. I'm actually gonna switch to Rennie. The reason I start with the metal ones is because you can tighten these down all the way uh, without worrying about it. And that gets the motor exactly in place. And then you can put in the Rennie screws and kind of substitute them one at a time. Uh, the Rennie screws don't usually break for me. They're pretty durable and they are gonna save some weight. The main danger with those is breaking the heads by over tightening them. 
So by getting the motor exactly in place with the metal screws, I, I really don't have to tighten it very much to get a strong hold with the Rennie screws. A full set of those metal screws weighs just over half a gram. And a full set of Rennie screws is about 0.1 grams. So if you can get these screws, it is going to help you with the weight. There it is with the new screws and the motor wires tucked in a little bit. We're getting pretty close to being able to fly this, but the main thing that I need is a way to mount this camera. So let me whip something up for that. The camera body is about 14 by 16 millimeters, I think. Yep, and it does have M2 screw holes on the side, so it could go into any kind of mount that would mount it with screws. I think I'll end up holding it with the lens most likely. And it looks like the lens barrel is about 6.6 .6 millimeters. These are some of the canopies I've used in the past. They print flat in TPU and then just bend into shape. But this new HD Zero Lite camera has a different shaped lens. It's really narrow and there's no lip on the end. So this is what I came up with. It's just a ring and it's going to friction fit around that lens. You might have to stretch it a little bit, but that's on purpose. So let me get this printed up. And here it is. I made this one extra thin to save some weight, but I think this will work. And another thing I like about this design is you can put the screw at different lengths on the back here, and that's going to end up adjusting the camera angle. And the canopy by itself weighs about half a gram. Well, here's something to keep an eye out for. Uh, when you put on the canopy, it's easy to twist this lens and put the camera out of focus. Uh, I did that on accident and I had to refocus it. You just twist it until it's sharp again. But to keep that from happening again, I'm gonna use some of this UV curing glue and just glue it in place now that I'm pretty confident of the focus. So just add a little bit of this glue all the way around in the gap. Flip around, shine the UV light. And should be good to go. This stuff sets almost instantly, which is why I like it. So here is the finished build. And what do you think? I think it looks pretty cool. I'm pretty happy with how this turned out. All I've got to do now is set it up in beta flight and it will be ready to fly. First, let's get the weight because weight is super important to how these perform. Just under 23 grams, and that's pretty sweet. That's a little bit lighter than the one that I made before, which makes sense. This camera and VTX are a tiny bit lighter, although it's heavier because I'm using BT 2.0 this time, and this connector and the extra wire length adds to it. So the fact that it's still lighter after that is pretty sweet. All right, enough talk. I am gonna go have some fun with this and get some flight footage. So I'll show you some of that now, and then we'll wrap up here and I'll tell you a few finishing touches that I put on the build and let you know what kind of battery time I'm getting.
I ended up flying like a dozen batteries because I was having so much fun with this in the backyard. Hopefully that comes through in the video. And yeah, I was pretty happy with the performance. It's not going to be like a light toothpick in terms of acro performance, but for a whoop carrying digital FPV, it is a ton of fun and I was having a lot of fun in the backyard. Uh, I do crash a lot. People ask me about that. You can see I got it a little bit dirty from landing in the grass, uh, but it has survived all of those crashes. The only damage to report is a little chip here on the plastic and another one over here. That doesn't matter at all. And then one spoke that's broken down here, that's easy to fix with E6000 glue. Uh, all the motor screws are holding, everything in the electronics is perfectly fine. So that's just good news all around. I wanna point out two quick things about durability. First, I think I forgot to mention, but under the camera, I put some dense foam. Can you see it under there? I always do that. And that's super important because an impact to the canopy could cause this camera to hit the VTX and you don't want that. So some dense foam under the camera between that and the VTX is super important. And then the other thing is this little red Express LRS antenna. When I first built this, I figured it'd be good to have it come out here. And so I actually taped it to the duct. I wanted to get it further away from the other electronics. But the problem is the frame will flex in a crash and having it taped to the duct turned out to be a bad idea because it ripped out of the hole. So since then I resoldered it and I just ran it through the frame and I've had no problems with the antenna getting damaged, no problems with range or reception. And so I definitely recommend putting this antenna somewhere safe and out of the way. In that flight, I was using these three blade HQ props. I think I like them better than the two blade props I had on earlier. That's just my personal preference. And then right here, I've got this ORT antenna. These antennas are super light, uh, not quite as light as the custom antennas that I build. It's just something that I've been trying out. The reception on these is great, but the other ones work well too. I'm not sure if it's worth the difference, but I wanted to point that out. And then for batteries, I was running these 300 million power batteries. Like I said, I get around three minutes racing around inside the house, around two minutes, maybe 215 outside. It really depends on how much high throttle I'm using. Two minutes is a pretty fast discharge. That is going to be pretty hard on the batteries, but it's a ton of fun. Um, that is with 25,000 kV 0802 motors. If you had a little bit lower KV, it might be a little bit more efficient. And that is running 48 kilohertz on the ESC firmware. Okay, just about the only thing I haven't covered is the beta flight setup for this drone. And uh, honestly, this video is getting long enough. I kind of want to wrap it up. So I'm not going to include that in this video. You can let me know in the comments if you have questions or if you want to see more details on that. But it's pretty standard if you use this older, sturdier beta FPV frame because the USB is going to be in the back, which means the flight co controller is going to be the normal way. So you're just going to set it up completely standard. This one is a little bit different because I rotated the flight controller so that USB would be on the side. You do have to make some changes to account for that. And I've made videos about that kind of thing in the past. So you can check that out. Uh, one thing I will say is that to reverse the motor directions uh, and get them correct, I'd use the BL Heli, I think I used BL Heli M configurator. And I had some weird issues with communication. Sometimes it wouldn't see all the ESCs and sometimes it would. So I don't know if that's an issue with this flight controller or if it was just a fluke, but I wanted to point that out. I just retried it a few times and I did get that to work. I used the new wizard in the 4.3 uh, Betaflight configurator to uh, adjust the motor mapping and that makes it really easy. So uh, let me know if you want more detail on that, but that's all I'm going to say for today. All right, well, that's it. Thanks for sticking with me all the way to the end of this video. I know it was a little bit long, but I really enjoy this stuff. I'm happy to share it with you guys. This is just a hobby and something that I do for fun. And if that's something that you appreciate, then please do hit that thumbs up button down below. It helps the YouTube metrics and I would appreciate that. Uh, subscribe if you wanna see more content in the future and comment down below. Uh, if you have any questions or you just want to discuss this build or digital FPV whoops or whatever, I'm pretty good at responding to those comments. So I'd be happy to talk to you down there. And otherwise, uh, take care, everyone, and I'll see you next time.